All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Hunting for Silver Linings, uh, brought to you by Startup Grind Grand Rapids. My name is Corey Hart. I'm the chapter director for the Grand Rapids chapter here at uh, Startup Grind. We're in the Great Lakes region of the United States in Michigan. And I have my colleague, we have uh, Yorgo Katsanos from Beneventure Partners, uh, also hosting this program. Uh, today is Friday, January 29. And uh, joining us, we have a very special guest. We have Mike all the way, um, from Alabama, who's relaunched a chapter in Birmingham uh, for Startup Grind. Mike, it's uh, so great to see you today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so we do this uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, we have uh, you know we have 600 plus chapter directors around the globe that uh, that really want to know about their brothers and sisters around the planet, affecting uh, change in the ecosystems globally. So they, this is a good opportunity for you to get introduced to everyone else, um, and then. Uh, we're also interested in breaking down barriers of stereotypes for what ecosystems hold across the planet and globe, especially the smaller and medium-sized ecosystems, which have like no shortage of innovation, right, or capital sometimes. And so we really want to um, get past like the, the Google search on what your uh, um, e ecosystem is like. So first, let's start with you, though. Uh, if you could give us a background on... Uh, on how you got into entrepreneurial uh, spirit, uh, how you got bit by the bug, um, how, and then you know what led you eventually to start up Grind. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so how I got into entrepreneurial spirit, I mean, it's a, a lot of people who like me, they'll probably tell you a similar story. I started out selling snacks back in high school. Um, I remember our high school took away, I did like this health conscious initiative, so they took away a lot of the more unhealthy things out of the vending machines. So I used to post up with, cinnamon rolls, chips, candy, Capri Suns, and uh, make, a, make a nice little, make some nice extra lunch money, basically. Um, so all the way back to then, you know, fast forward to college, I started a clothing brand, started an event, for, uh, event firm as well. Um, started working with founders and creatives. It's always kind of been a, you know, let's, let's figure this out and let's just do more than the status quo type of person. Uh, so, you know, after college, I, I tried my hand at the uh, at, at a startup, at an ed tech startup, solo founder, uh, solo team member, non-technical. So, you know, I ended up having to kind of let that go by the wayside because I couldn't deliver on some things, but it was a great learning experience. I um, did a lot of consulting for nonprofits and other and other startups. Uh, now my background, you know, I dabble more now uh, in product program management and helping founders with things like optimizing their revenue strategy and go to market. Um, and then I also do some some venture scouting for a few different funds. I'm a venture partner with Republic. Uh, and then how I got into Startup Grind is, as I mentioned, um, you know, I was a I was a part of the original chapter or the most recent iteration of the chapter. I was a member uh, when it, when it, before it went dormant in 2017. Got an email like September saying, "Hey, we see that you're here. We're looking for somebody to restart this. What do you think?" I was like, "Yeah." Let's give it a shot. Um, and, you know, launched it back up in October. And, you know, we just actually did our third event yesterday. Cool. Congratulations. And, uh, and welcome to the uh, family of directors. Uh, I know that we're, uh, we're grateful to have you. Um, could you tell us uh, what your role is at the, as, as this uh, venture scout? And you said you work with a couple different uh, funds. Could you explain the, the focus of each of those and, uh, and, and kind of like what, what excites you and fills you up about that? Ah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, for me, my mission is to build bridges between purpose and resources, specifically for non-traditional founders and overlooked markets. So, you know, as a scout, I look for these opportunities to get these founders in front of people who have those resources. So, you know, in terms of funds, it's pretty agnostic uh, because there's somebody in my network who invests in just about anything except hardware and bio. I don't have anybody there. Um, but I, I typically dabble more in the early stage space. So when I'm, you know, looking to, uh, looking for founders, look for opportunities, I'm looking for three things. So it's all about the, the team first, and then the product, and then, or the team, then the market, and then the product. Um, I like to use the analogy that, you know, once a, once a ship sets sail, it's hard to change the people on board, but you can always change direction. Uh, so you want to make sure you get those, those, those early team members right as quick as you can. I like that analogy. <laughs> that's, that's cute. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, 
No, yeah, early stage, uh, early stage investing. That must make you a very popular guy in your uh, in your uh, community. <laughs> uh, not not as much. Uh, so I am. I'm still I'm still working to kind of build a name for myself and get known for quality deal flow within the ecosystem. And you know, so Birmingham specifically, we're still punching up in terms of being a tech hub. Uh, so there's still a long way to go. Uh, but you know, I am starting to get starting to get some cold outreach coming in myself. I'm usually the one that's sending it, but you know, as of late, I've uh, I've been setting up some processes to try to you know streamline my access to founders. So it's it's, it's growing, you know. But I still have a long way to go. Now, Yorgo and I have uh, been discovering and learning a lot about uh, some some struggles is actually finding you know you know good deal flow uh, that uh, incubators and accelerators aren't necessarily that great at uh, at supplying those right. in the last like six ten uh, months. Um, so, can you speak about that? Uh, yeah, I don't want to try. I want to. I don't want it to get misconstrued. Definitely not knocking anybody's ideas or anything, but. Um, you know, it's great that the barriers of entry to starting a company are, are getting lower, but with that, the quality goes sometimes as well. Things can be, it can get to be really noisy in a lot of spaces. You're uh, hitting the nail on the head. It's <laughs> quality, not quantity. It's hundred percent correct. Exactly. So it's like, it, it, it's hard to kind of, kind of sift through that noise. So, you know, I, but I do love the fact that there are more, you know, idea stakes, incubators, and accelerators coming because, I mean, ask anybody in this space and they'll tell you it's about the number of shots on goal that you get. So, you know, if this, if this incubator can churn out 25 companies over two, three, four, five years, you know, law of averages, one of them is going to hit. So <laughs> it's just being able to be patient and being able to find that diamond in the rough. Right. Um, so, uh, that, that's that's very interesting. Uh, you you'll I think you're the the first uh, director we've had on that uh, plays in this uh, in this pond. So uh, it, it's some it's, it's some really great insight and some good value for the rest of the community to have you aboard. Um, Yorgo, do you have so. any uh, questions on uh, what he's involved with? Yeah, exactly. That's um, any particular sector, so Mike, that you saw particularly in relation to pre-COVID, during the COVID, and as we are now. And, and what do you see the big change? Um, well, I'm sure you probably, probably have heard this, but of course, you know, during COVID that accelerated things like remote work and collaboration tools and all things like that. Uh, one of the big, one of the biggest, I'm not gonna say changes, but one of the biggest surprises was that, you know, people thought that uh, some certain industries where people thought there was one market leader who's gonna eat it, like who's gonna like win it all. They were actually, you know, had some success, but then you know it, it wasn't as catastrophic as people thought. The example I like to like to point to here is Zoom and Hop In. So Hop In caught some great timing, but they also have a pretty nice product. And what they've been able to do in that virtual event space is nothing short of amazing in such that short amount of time. Uh, but personally, for me, I also love to see that the ed tech is getting its just due now. I'm big in the education space. I want to see a lot of innovation there. So I hate, I hate that it took a global pandemic, but looking for silver linings, now, they, now they're getting the eyes and the attention it deserves. And I'm hoping that some of these innovations can stick and it's gonna really push the industry forward. Uh, within, within ed tech, uh, so what was, uh, what was the genesis of your, of your interest there? And clearly you have a passion for it still. Um, so okay. where, where'd that come from? Uh, so when you look back 50, 50 years or so, and look at all the other industries and sectors, there's been some type of major innovation in each one that really pushes things forward. But when you get to education, we're still using the same archaic teaching styles and methods, the same grading systems and the same testing systems that are holding a lot of people back and leaving a lot of people left by the wayside as it comes to you know, their professional lives and careers. So I really wanna be a, a king slayer and king maker in that space because it's gonna take people who are audacious enough to go after some of these legacy players to either try to help them innovate or show them that, hey, there's a better way. And I think, like I said, like the pandemic has shown us that the old system is obviously broken. Anybody who works in the academic space will tell you that. So now more people see that. Um, so it's, it's good to see that attention coming there. But for me, I mean, all the way back to college, my first internship, I was helping build curriculums for a family school uh, in the K, K through eight space. This was in 20, 
2011, so almost a almost almost a decade now. Um, then just from there, I you know worked at a couple ed, uh, education-based nonprofits, sat on some junior boards and advisory committees for community programs. It's always been something that I've been very passionate about in trying to usher in, like I said, usher innovation in the space. Uh, now, Yorgo here has uh, uh, a lot of thoughts on uh, on education and where where some of the gaps are. Uh, do you have anything to contribute? <clears throat> no, but with Mike um, and I should do one day, we should sit back and compare notes because Definitely. what he's describing, and, and correct me, Mike, what you're describing is products, people, and processes that need to move forward. And they're not moving because of an inertia. Exactly, exactly. It's because the people, it's the people who make these decisions, you're not going to get into all that. But yeah, yes, yes, there, there needs to be- I'll get into that, system. yes, off the record, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll stay off that soapbox for this one. Um, well, in that in that regard, in that space, uh, uh, what are what are, what are some innovations that that you've noticed and you're excited about? Um, because we we have some ecosystem builders across the planet that we've talked to that are really excited about ed tech, um, specifically in some of the medium sized markets in Africa, uh, where infrastructure uh, in some cases is better than what we experience in a lot of parts of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're able to actually sustain and support technology for ed tech. And then there's some challenges in other uh, ecosystems where infrastructure simply just is not there. And so those opportunities suck. So uh, yeah. curious to hear your, your impressions, uh, maybe locally and then expand it uh, nationally and globally, if, if you have any in insight that way. Uh, yeah, so I know locally, we do have a program called Ed Farm and they have an early stage um, Ed Tech Accelerator that they, that they just launched. I don't, the first cohort hasn't come out yet, so I can't really can't really speak much to what that's going to look like. Um, but in terms of you know the things that I am really excited about, uh, is gamification is a big one, um, in gamified learning. I think that's one way that these legacy publishers can find ways to repurpose their content that's been pushed upon a primarily forced audience for so long, and they can stay competitive in this Ed Tech arms race. I think adaptive learning and adaptive LMSs are going to be big because teaching the student at their pace and level should be, it should be done more. Um, you know, un in understanding their interests and helping them align their actual interests to the curriculum itself. Uh, I think that's going to be big. And then another one is the community-based piece because I think this hybrid learning model is going to be one that sticks. Like even after after we go back to normal, uh, there are gonna be a lot of people who don't really wanna return to that broken system if, the, if it hasn't been changed. So we're gonna see a lot of opportunity for, to use the hybrid learning model. And I think that building a community piece on top of that is going to be big because there are still a lot of LMSs and a lot of curriculum delivery systems who haven't quite figured out that piece. And you know, when you look at traditional schooling, whether it be K-12 or higher ed, community is a big piece of that. So once they're able, like whoever is able to figure out that piece and, and drop an LMS on top of a community driven uh, platform, they have an opportunity to win really big. So um, do, uh, do smaller to mid-sized uh, regionally focused um, uh, liberal arts colleges, um, are they gonna be innovated out of relevance? Uh, it's a great question. And, and one I don't and one I don't think I'm qualified to answer, but I'll definitely give an opinion. I think there's an opportunity for for some of these smaller schools to keep themselves relevant and keep earning students tuition mm -hmm. by finding ways to innovate. Um, either they yeah, or they're going to see themselves wiped out. I mean, I think we already saw a couple of schools during the, during the height of COVID having to close their doors because they weren't able to get uh, students and they weren't able to effectively transition to the, to the virtual model. And people realized that, you know, why would I pay tens of thousands of dollars to learn virtually when I can quite literally go on Udemy, YouTube, Coursera, and learn a lot of the same things. Yeah, the great courses. I love, I've always loved the great courses, those guys. <laughs> that's yeah, that's incredible. Before MOOCs, right? Like they're, they're, they're shipping <laughs> CDs. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, Yorgo, do you have anything uh, uh, to ask or to contribute before we move on to the ecosystem? The only observation is that some of the liberal arts colleges will focus on 
their competitive advantage, which I think may not have been necessarily higher education. It may have been a combination of community class education. Mm -hmm. And I think this model is not broken. If you think about the origins of liberal arts education being essentially, to some extent religious, but also by necessity focused on animal husbandry, agriculture, a little bit of law and accounting, essentially the trades as opposed to blue sky research and or other kinds of academia, then this model will resurface. And this model will regain credibility, especially if these colleges and, and smaller institutions focus on what they do best, which is to serve their local community. Well, 100% agree. Um, it actually leads me to something else I like is uh, the growth of the middle skilled. So these are, um, these are essentially credentials, like like kind of how like Google does their digital credentials, credentials where people don't necessarily need four year degrees for these. And I've seen a lot of community colleges and smaller colleges play in this space for their local communities and helping them do these six weeks, six month, you know, uh, nine month type of uh, digital credentials, and then helping them upskill their careers that way. Um, and on top of that the idea of what you're mentioning, Mike, um, the idea of um, don't shoot for some kind of degree, but shoot for continuous education. Because in a sense, continuous education can be priced more competitively, both for the recipient, but also for the giver. In other words, for the, the person who provides the, the, the know-how. And of course, you have the element of scalability. If you have a global campus, and you can uh, tweak the prices accordingly, then you can have uh, all kinds of uh, synergistic opportunities. Right, exactly. Well, since we're, uh, since we're uh, uh, on the topic of education, uh, we usually talk about talent when we're talking about uh, ecosystems. Um, and you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the certificate programs and, and skills gaps and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. is your ecosystem, is it churning out in your regional um, uh, education systems? Is it churning out the talent that you need or is there that skills gap? Uh, what does a talent landscape look like in your ecosystem? So, okay, so that's a twofold question. I'll answer it from the perspective of Birmingham first and then the Southeast at large. Um, so Birmingham, as I mentioned, it's, it's punching up. Um, in, 20, in 2017, I was actually part of a rollout for a campaign for alternative education that targeted under and unemployed individuals or young adults and helped them get trained, certified, and placed in high paying tech careers. Uh, so things like um, IT help desk management, we trained, some, we trained some software engineers. They also rolled out programs around data science as well. So in terms of the talent that startups and companies would need, it's, it's getting there, it's growing. Um, I think to date over 500 people have been uh, you know, trained or certified. So it's, it's coming. It, it's, 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 it's the, the flywheel is slowly coming. 100 is not a small number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so it, it's coming now. But then when you look at the region itself, you have places like uh, Atlanta with Georgia Tech. They're, they're, the, 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 the tech talent coming out of Georgia Tech is, is amazing. And you can see that with some of the uh, some of the recent news that's coming out of there. I mean, in, in the last six months, Atlanta has given us three unicorns with Sales Loft, Greenlight, and most recently Calendly. Um, so things like that are great for the ecosystem. I believe there's also some great tech talent in like the Carolinas as well. Um, and then another blossoming thing that's happening is uh, you have Dr. Cephas. She works at Amazon. Um, she just recently bought 12 acres in Jackson, Mississippi to build a black tech hub to start developing the tech talent there locally as well. Uh, so, you know, give it, I know I had one of a, a, a mentor of mine told me that you, these things usually take about five years to really see any progress and 10 years to realize like, oh, it's working. So, you know, give it, give it a five or 10 years and you, you, you start to see where things coming out. Well, to the, to the uh, topic of timeline, um, is it really going to take that long? We've seen acceleration so much across everything this last year. I mean, is, is the demand going to force the fact that uh, they've got to work faster? Right. No, I, I totally agree with you there. And so in terms of that, I would say that it's going to be some external factors. 
Um, so when you start seeing more exits in places that start bringing more attention and eyes, then yeah, okay, then people start paying attention. So for instance, you have um, in Birmingham that was shipped. Ship got bought. I'm not if you're not familiar with Ship, they're a grocery delivery service. They got bought by Target for 500 million. To my knowledge, that's the that's the one shining star in the tech scene for Birmingham right now. So you know, obviously that that's that's significant. But is it enough to really get the, get the uh, get things turning and make people want to come here and start building here? Eh, it remains to be seen. But I think like with Atlanta, you're going to see a lot more people moving there. They're starting to see more people moving there as they leave the NYCs and the San Francisco's. Um, or <laughs> if you look at places like Miami, who just recently announced their partnership with SoftBank and SoftBank is going to commit 100 million to their ecosystem. Yeah, I think things are going to go considerably faster there now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you can get eyes on the region and get people willing to really invest in building out these ecosystems, then absolutely it can move a lot faster. But if not, then you kind of kind of have to go with, they kind of work with what they got. Sure. So now that you brought that up, uh... Um, what are some of the uh, the shining stars on um, like uh, ecosystem support organizations? Is it is it mostly uh, like co-working accelerators? Is it uh, do we have like uh, tech uh, support from universities? Is it is it corporations that have innovation hubs? Like what's what's that look like? Uh, yeah. So here locally, I'm glad to say that in the last year, 18 months or so, we've seen exponential growth in the startup support scene uh, closer at the grassroots. So we added a Techstars program uh, for Energy Accelerator with Alabama Power. And we also added a generator program um, through, well, yeah, through, through generator and the, the local um, C, CGFI Bronze Valley. Um, so, you know, that's, that's great. Uh, Innovation Depot is, you know, that's like the, the local innovation hub, the office space, things like that. Uh, they actually just introduced two new programs and a co-working space. Uh, like in the last two, three months. Um, so those smaller level players, they're, they're there and it, it's coming. You know, Techstars put out their, fo their first cohort, I think last month, Generator did their first cohort in November. Um, so, you know, it's, it's starting to turn them out, uh, but you know, there's still a lot of work to be done and, and there's a lot of more help that can be used upstream. And, uh, and, and we like to talk about uh, the investment landscape and clearly like you're, you're involved there. Um, is it if I'm if I'm a young founder and I've got some traction, I've got that quality startup we talked about, where I've got my team, everyone's on the boat, and we're we're sailing, the wind's picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, what what's what's that landscape like for friends, family, angels? Like, how where where are the where are the gaps, where are the challenges, or where do you excel? Uh, yeah, so we talk about friends and family around. Uh, I think that's that's going to be contingent on uh, who your friends and family are. So, <laughs> yeah. so people, people who look like me, yeah, we're not raising friends and family around. Um, but other people who are like, oh, yeah, yeah, you have a little more luck. Um, but in terms of like institutional and more organized investing, there, there are a few firms or a couple of firms down here now who are putting some money in the space and then helping to bring more companies to Alabama. Uh, but there's still, there's still a lot of work to be done there. And, you know, for me, I actually, the way I see it is, that early funding, that angel money, pre-seed money is not really the, the thing that's going to help that much. I mean, it's great to have. Yes, don't get me wrong. But if, if, these, if the larger players want to convince startups and companies to stay and be localized here, then there needs to be more money at the Series A, Series B, and later growth stages. If not, then they're going to go elsewhere, which is usually to the coast mm -hmm. or, the other, or the places where capital is more prominent. Mm -hmm. Corey, can we stay on this issue for a moment? Because I think um, uh, Mike is, is uh, mentioning a couple of interesting things. First of all, you're still talking about unicorns. In, in our experience, there's a difference be in, between developing an ecosystem and developing a unicorn. Absolutely. So unicorns can come out of everywhere. Ecosystems don't. The ecosystem is a holistic approach where you bring together not only money and uh, innovation, but also a number of ancillary services. And these supporting services are particularly mentorship, coaching, access to academic centers of excellence, and uh, essentially a system that facilitates, quote unquote, constructive failure, right? If you don't have constructive failure, 
and everybody's looking down upon failure, then you're never going to go forward. You need people who have failed to trying to do things, I think. So that's a very interesting point because from what I've seen, you know, in major startup and tech hubs, people can wear their failures like a badge of honor. But outside of tech and in other places where it's not as prominent, failure isn't looked at through the same lens. So I think there's a disconnect there and, you know, being able to navigate that is somewhat difficult for some people. Uh, but I do agree that with their, all the other services outside of Jets Capital, um, but I can only speak from my perspective and the perspective of black founders and, and people of color in the space, we're usually over mentored and actually under supported in terms of capital. Even when you look at the happenings that of all throughout 2020, and, you know, the murder of George Floyd and all the other racial unrest, it led to a lot of these venture capital firms and consultants and startup advisors saying, hey, we'll give you, we'll allocate this block of time for one-on-ones and mentorship with black founders. We're good. Like, I promise you they're good. Um, it's, they, they need the funding because you can, you can do all the advising and give all the, all the advice all the theoretical stuff you want. But at the end of the day, if these founders don't have the capital to act on that advice, it's all moot. Okay, so you bring in the second point. <clears throat> How do you qualify success? What is, let's talk about from the perspective of the incubator or the accelerator or the VC, whatever you want to call on the one hand, and on the other hand, from the perspective of the entrepreneur. Okay. So are you, for, for additional clarity, are you asking how would I qualify success for an ecosystem? Yes. All right, so I will qualify success for an ecosystem for the, the number of, or the volume of good outcomes, basically. Because when you're looking at some of these smaller markets, they don't necessarily need to have the, they don't need, they don't, they don't need to have billion dollar exits for it to create giant windfalls and change within their local ecosystem. Like they can have, you could exit for a hundred million dollars and then all of the people involved like early in that startup, they're some like you, if you say like 15% of those might actually start a venture firm and start investing in the other startup, which that's the flywheel you need. And then now they have that experience to go and mentor other, other founders. So I think like that, that can be a measure of success, just the number of, uh, the number of, of great, of good or great outcomes. And you can look at that as, you know, millions, millions raised, whether it be C, Series A, just overall funding. You can look at acquisitions and exits. You can look at the revenue that these companies have, the revenue that these companies have been able to produce. You can also look at it as the employee size. Because when you talk about, when you talk about increasing spending locally and growing locally, and all of these things, people always talk about small businesses, but small businesses might what hire 10 people, 20 people. If you get a tech company that can catch fire, even if they do end up going belly up and maybe the series A round, they may still have 50, 60 employees. And for a time, they were getting paid nicely. And that money was kind of was trickling back and going back into the local ecosystem, which is still a win. And from what I understand, once you're in tech, you're in tech. So they can go and get other jobs and go maybe go and start other companies. And they're on that path to continue their growth professionally and salary wise. Mike, this is a great perspective. You're actually hitting a number of biases on the head. This is a great presentation. Thank you. You're clarifying what success means from the perspective of the entrepreneurs, from the perspective of the local community, but also from the perspective of the investors, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, I, just, I just look at my own personal interests. It's like people are, I think that's what, that's what keeps a lot of VCs from going to some of these tier two and tier three markets because they're, they're always taught like, yeah, how's this going to return the fund 10x? How's this going to get a, a, a billion dollar exit? I'm like, well, you know, it's all about one, your ownership stake in it. So you, do you actually need a billion dollar exit for this to be success for you? I guess you want to return, you know, LP's money four or five X. But I mean, yo, 2x, 3x, that's still positive sum. Like that's still, you're still generating alpha. So, you know, take the win if you can get it. So, you know, like in these, in the, in the Atlantas, in the Birmingham's, in the Nashville's, in the Tampa's, 
uh, like in the Denver, you don't necessarily need billion dollar exits. You can ex exit for 250 million and I promise you everybody's happy. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you. You hit the ball out of the park, Mike. I mean, this is excellent points. And essentially, the press is looking at the unicorns. They're not looking at the ecosystem. Right. That's, that, that's who gets all the praise. That's who gets the TechCrunch articles, is the unicorns, which I think is another flaw of the industry itself. Because I would I, tell me about the people who just hit 50 million in ARR. Like, or just like, tell me about them. Tell me about the, or tell me about the founder who bootstrap to 1 million ARR. Like that's, that right there, that's a success story. Yeah, that's your person, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, you, like they have something. They, like, they know how to serve their customers. Because at the end of the day, right. the best investment is customer revenue. Um, and that's, uh, that's interesting. So with all of the founders that you've been uh, interfacing with uh, on all, all different sides, um, how have, how have people in your ecosystem handled that shift, the shift of the customer? Because a lot of companies just kind of like lost their customer this last 12 months. Like they don't even exist anymore uh, yeah. because the problem they're solving is no longer a problem. The problem's shifted. So how, what's that been like? I've seen a lot of resilience. I've seen a lot of people keep their pivot foot really strong and, and plant it solid. And I love it because when you, from the investor perspective, that's what you want to see. You want to see a company that can be gritty, resilient, resourceful, scrappy, and, and find ways to get it done. Um, and one of the big learnings there, and that what I have to tell some founders, is pivoting does not mean that you have failed. Pivoting actually means that you have a great understanding of what your customer wants and doesn't want. Like, so if you're pivoting to go towards something that your customer is pulling you towards, yes, let's figure out how to make this happen. If you're pivoting towards something that you see as a trend, where you're trying to chase a check, well, let's probably not do that because it's not going to go the way you expect. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I've seen a lot of resiliency. Okay, cool. Um, sounds like uh, that your, your ecosystem is fairly collaborative. Is that, is that correct? Uh, so that's kind of, that's twofold. Uh, so me, I'm big on collaboration. I know like I know the whole cliche of rising tide lifts all boats. I know that teamwork makes the dream work. All of, <laughs> all, all of, all of those things. Um, so I'm very intentional about out, like reaching out and trying to bring people together. I, I call myself a professional dot connector. Like if I can't help you, I'm pretty sure I know somebody who can, and I'm gonna try to make that happen. And you know, my personal network, it spans beyond just the Southeast. So I'm able to make a lot of connections that way. But then when you get down to some of these uh, lesser, some of these smaller cities where these are things, these are still new concepts, a lot of people who act in silos and they have the best intentions, so, but it's not always uh, the outcomes that you would think or how they act on those intentions. That's actually one of the reasons I agreed to bring the chapter back because mm -hmm. I saw a lot of these people acting in silos, uh, supposedly wanting the same goal. I'm like, oh, all right, well, the only dog I have in this fight is wanting to see a better localized tech ecosystem, one that's inclusive of all, right. not just a few. So here, use this platform to come together neutrally, neutral home base, neutral site, and let's help do this and achieve this. And then when you go back to your own separate silos, do whatever you want. But here, we try to be collaborative. Yeah, and in, in our region or my region up here in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, West Michigan, incredibly um, siloed, segmented, segregated, uh, gener generationally. Uh, and yes. um, we don't know what's going on 45 minutes away. So. And then there's a lot of hesitancy when I come around, like, they're like, what's your agenda? Like, what, what do you want? Like, right. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. My agenda is community. Like I actually, I don't take money from anybody. So I don't have to, I don't, I don't want to be talking to anyone else's talking points. My talking point is bigger table. Let's set a bigger table people. So <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. Um, now my, I guess my, my stereotypical opinion of the Southeast there is that, that, uh, y'all are a little more collaborative and there's a little more exchange between cities and regions. Um, we see that happening. We just had uh, um, uh, Adrian Smith from Winston-Salem uh, on and that region's well known for collaboration between cities and communities. Um, can you maybe help me, help me, uh, help me out? <laughs> what's, what's going on down there? Oh, 
Well, you know, I can't really, I can't really speak to to what's going on there. Uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's getting better, but it's still a long way to go in terms of kind of working more collaboratively, collaboratively to do that. Um, so, you know, I think maybe larger players getting involved could help. For a, for instance, you have Apple in there. The partnership they did with HBCU to put the Propel Center in Atlanta. Well, the firm I mentioned earlier, Ed Farm here in Birmingham, designed that. So I think I think that could you know things like that can help kind of build these bridges between all these different tier two metros throughout the southeast. Um, you have you have initiatives like uh, build in build in southeast. Um, they're they're helping to kind of you know one let you know about the different different hubs and then do different initiatives to kind of bring those hubs together. Um, so you know, it's going to take more of those more, more of that intentionality. I believe is going is going to be what really is the catalyst for that. Uh, or more people who think like, you know, me, you and I, who say, you know, like, hey, we, we just want to build this, this community. Um, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be a city that, all right, so yesterday in my event with our VCs, Eric Bond at Hustle Fund, he mentioned something that really stuck with me, saying Silicon Valley is a mindset, not a place. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about I don't want to say dethroning San Francisco as the tech hub, but to use that rhetoric for the sake of this conversation, when you think about the place that's going to do that, it's not going to be one city. I think it's going to be a region. So for instance, if the entire Southeast were to work together collaboratively to do that for the startups and founders throughout the region, that can really be fruitful and impactful because you have different people who have connections to corporate partners and helping with brand development because that's what founders need. They need access to customers and market. So if you can go from getting you know, access to say one market and all the companies in San Francisco to getting access to the entire Southeastern market, which gives you access to a lot of companies from Texas to the Carolinas and Florida, mm -hmm. well now you, know, you can see a lot more exponential growth a lot faster. That's cool. Yeah. So when I, um, because we're an automotive hub up here, you know, in the Midwest and yeah, back, like hundred years ago, we did really great as far as like Grand Rapids, Michigan supports Detroit and like the whole state basically operates, you know, like built cars. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, people are like, so, you know, like, why can't we be why can't we be like a San Francisco? I'm like, you know, there's a reason why Tesla wasn't invented in Detroit. Like we're automotive capital but we just don't have the brain we don't have the mindset for it yeah. also why it wasn't invented in uh in munich you know or austria or italy i was there's a reason why it came out of san francisco but there's also a reason why our mindset in our region supports tesla we get to build things for them you know because right. that's what we're good at but it helps uh, like, like, like tesla's a tech company not a car company they just happen to build cars <laughs> um, so yeah it's I get it. Now, I will say there is some collaboration between Birmingham and Huntsville, though. Like, Huntsville is like the, I would say they're, they're probably the tech hub of Alabama right now, um, mostly known for what they, what's happening in the aerospace uh, sector. But, you know, it's, it's things, things are growing. I like it. So then, oh, no, I feel like I should say that no, no region, state, or city should look to be the next Silicon Valley. Like, I would, I would much appreciate it if people stop putting Silicon anything in front of their name. For the <laughs> Silicon Beach, Silicon. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nah, to kill all that. Like, look for the way to utilize your local ecosystem and what you can do best, and build on that. Like, Birmingham is very strong in healthcare and financial services. So, like, it's not far fetched for Birmingham to, for Birmingham or Alabama to become a hub in health tech and fintech. Like, these this is that's something that is very achievable. I mean, UAB is the largest employer in Birmingham by leaps and bounds. And then you have uh, regions. Regions is like the second. I think I think regions might be the second largest employer. But like, yeah, that's one of the biggest corporate partners here as well. So like, there's a great opportunity for startups here if they're, if they're looking to build in those spaces. And since you're on the topic of sectors, what other sectors uh, uh, have some exciting things happening uh, in your area? Um, well, no, so in my area, I, those, those two are the ones that I think are doing the, you know, or have the potential to do the most. Um, other sectors I'm excited about, personally, I like uh, impact in civitech and like government relations. 
I think there's going to be a growing, a growing uh, trend of sustainability across all industries. People realize that sustainability is in every industry problem, not just supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know about y'all, but like if we ever do make it to Mars, it's probably it's going to only be like the 0.5% of us. So, you know, we probably need to figure this out on our end, how to, how to be better for the climate, how to, you know, reduce waste, um, how to adopt models of the circular economy, like what can we do? Uh, look at looking at smart cities and mobility, energy grids, like how can we implement these things efficiently and feasibly? Um, so I'm really excited about that, that civic innovation space as well. And do you have uh, uh, do you have a public sector there that is excited? They have an appetite for innovation. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's more <laughs> it's, it's it's better than it was before. So we just so Birmingham most recently elected the youngest mayor in the city's history. So with that comes a great shift in mindset. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there you know there were some programs and things started. Um, but even, even, even with that, it's all about the people you surround yourself with. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a slow, it's a slow turn. Um, I think they, you know, I'm not really that familiar with their programs. I think they did lay, lay the foundation for some things to be innovated upon, but as but what really matters and what, and what we've seen from a national level is does not matter what ha what you do during your administration is what the next person decides to keep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I like that. Um, so, uh, Yorgo, before I move on to the next topic, uh, anything from you? Well, um, Mitch, uh, Mike is summarizing a whole range of things again. And, and I have to tell you, Mike, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today because your eyes are wide open. And having had the experience you've had, you're now able to put your finger where it really, really hurts. You're touching upon that uh, an issue that Professor Markman touched. In other words, how do you turn around a community? A community that has been forgotten because the supply chain made them irrelevant. A community where the human capital walked away, where the population is aging and the infrastructure is falling apart. And your answer, I think, is, is very similar. You have to create a coral. You have to create a, an anchoring vessel. And you need to convince the local government that is in their interest to create the ecosystem and participate in building it. Yes. It is, is, it is a constant public-private partnership. Yes, absolutely. Because there, there's, no, there's no one vertical of these contributors who can make these, thing, these things happen on their own. Like they need their help from, they need regulatory help. Um, so convincing them that is not always the easiest. But, you know, if I'm ever in the room to have those conversations, I'm going to use what Mayor Suarez has been doing in Miami as a case study, because he has shown how to recruit to your city, how to be, um, how to be welcoming to change and, you know, take focus. It's still, up, it's still you know, to be seen how, uh, how they're incorporating locally. Uh, cause, you know, the one thing I, the one thing, you know, you never want to have in those situations is, you know, accelerated gentrification. You want to make sure that the local community is involved, that you're building things that support them as well, and they're involved in those changes. Um, but yes, intentionality at the government level to partner with the players is going to be extremely critical for a sustainable ecosystem anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, just a few minutes left, and I want to. Uh, we we ask. Uh, all of our chapter directors to address the topic of uh, equity in their in their ecosystem. Uh, around the planet, equity means different things for different ecosystems. Um, what's uh, what's the, what's the temperature uh, like? Is, are there are there movements in in, in reducing barriers to access uh, in in your ecosystem? Uh, yeah, I think there I think there there are some things that are happening. Um, and one of the places I mentioned earlier, Innovation Depot. So they just recently rolled out uh, three or two new programs to go along with one accelerator they already had. So the one that was already in place is called Velocity. It was a you know post product accelerator, kind of like seed stage, help you you know they give you um, like 50k for six or seven percent or something like that. But now they recently reached they recently launched an idea stage accelerator that's uh, designed to help people still with still within their nine to fives. 
value, uh, validate some ideas that they have and get to an MVP. And, and they introduce some new just base level startup one on one style programming and they're kind of in there pushing it out to the market. So it's helping people get more acclimated to the tech scene and have an understanding of what's actually going on and realizing that, you know, it may be a little bit easy is not the word, but it's not as, you know, like it's not as foreign or hard to to kind of get involved as some people may may think. I mean, you got the small business owner who's been doing things manually for so long, not realizing that, hey, this proprietary process that you have for managing your inventory, you find you somebody, you find you a developer who can build you some tech on behind that, you can go raise money for that. Or you can you can improve your processes in your system and sell that to other SMBs. Like that's just bridging that knowledge gap is the first step there. Um, and I think there, there, there are things happening that can do that. The work that I'm trying to do with Startup Grind is, is for that as well. Um, you know, that's the, that's the purpose of building an inclusive ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Birmingham is 73 or 78% black. So, you know, it's, it's imperative that, that, eco, that those people, that segment of people do not get left out in this ongoing, you know, industrial revolution 4.0. Yeah, the, the next industrial revolution. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left here. Um, uh, we always uh, we always also ask this 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 uh, final question. Uh, it's um, what can the uh, the global network of startup grind chapters director chapter directors do for what can we do for Mike? What can we do for Birmingham? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think you know just well co promotion. Uh, and not just promoting events, but like collaborating on events. How can we, you know, get the brightest minds and change makers in front of each other's communities? Uh, I think, you know, that can always, that can always help. My goal with this was to bring more eyes uh, regionally and nationally to this region, uh, to bring more, more awareness to what's going on and what's happening. So, you know, any ways that we can do that, always down to, to figure out how we can make that happen. Um, and then just 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 capital, uh, bringing more capital in and startup resources, you know, because we're still we're still pretty light on on that side as well. And you know, I am not a check writer yet myself yet. Um, so there's that. And then <laughs> in an offline conversation, uh, we could probably have around you know some more aggressive tactics. I am thinking about to get to that check writer status. Oh great! Uh, so you know, there's that's a that's a more private conversation, but yeah, always down to down to having to connect and figure out ways we can like, can collaborate. I mean, there are a lot of other um, local chapters who have similar ecosystems to Birmingham, so I think we can share notes and figure out ways to help us grow and build partnerships together. Yeah, that that's a really good idea. Um, uh, I've always I've always wanted to put together a, uh, a, a kind of like a summit. Uh, mm -hmm. For regionally sized, region, like uh, and similarly challenged chapters, um, and now you—that—that's a really good idea. I think uh, I think you and I should do that. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's okay. make it happen. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I think the uh, I think the the guys at HQ will probably be behind that as well. You probably have a, a a few more resources to help it out than just us. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, Yorgo, any last uh, comments? No, I just want to thank um, thank Mike for uh, his insight. I think that coming from the trenches, you're very advanced, if I may say so, because you've seen both the opportunity and also the threat. And the threat is essentially doing nothing. 100%, 100%. Um, nothing changes if nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, I really appreciate you, uh, you guys bringing me on. Uh, great time, I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, we, uh, we, we often uh, feel like an hour is not enough because uh, it's like making new best friends every time because <laughs> we're all, you know, like building and building and love building and love uh, just being so curious about what's going on with each other. So, um, yeah, uh, really appreciate the generosity of your time. Uh, should you need anything that uh, Yorgo and I and through our network of chapter directors that we now have after doing about 120 of these uh, things since last March, um, please never hesitate to reach out. Um, and then we'll, of course, be checking in uh, with you again. So um, thank you again. Have a good night. And then.